Coin tosses, dice rolls, and roulette wheel spins are commonly regarded as examples of what we've been calling a fair chance setup. But are they really? There are two kinds of objections you sometimes hear. One is that outcomes of coin tosses and dice rolls can't be random because their behavior in the real world is governed by deterministic physical laws. So what we see is an illusion of randomness, not genuine randomness. Now that's a general claim. Another type of objection focuses on the detailed physics of particular cases and looks for discrepancies between the actual behavior and the behavior of an idealized chance setup. I want to look at both of these kinds of objections because I think the issues they raise are really interesting. Here's one way to present the objection based on deterministic laws. First, assume that the motion of the coin is in fact governed by deterministic physical laws. If so, then for any initial condition, the final state of the condition is determined. On some set of initial conditions it will land heads, on some other set it will land tails. But if so, then it seems like we should say that the probability of the coin landing heads or tails should be 0 or 1, depending on the initial conditions, not 0.5. Now, a fair chance setup says that for each trial, each outcome has an equal chance of showing up. But this isn't the case for a real coin toss governed by deterministic laws. Each outcome doesn't have an equal chance of showing up. So we conclude that a real coin toss can't be a fair chance setup if its behavior is governed by deterministic physical laws. Now, there is something very compelling about this line of reasoning. There are plenty of people who would agree with the gist of this in the sense that they don't believe that objective probability exists in the world. But even if you grant this, it's too quick to conclude that there's no such thing as a fair coin toss. This argument says nothing about the predictability of the coin toss. All it says is that the outcomes are determined. But it's a separate thing to say that the outcomes can be predicted. If we shift the focus from determinism to predictability, then we might be able to bring probabilities back into the description of the setup. Let's talk for a bit about classical physics and predictability. Here's a ball rolling around on a surface, like a pool table. Set the ball in motion in a particular direction and will bounce off the walls in a predictable fashion. If I gave it a push in this direction, you can trace out in your head how it's going to move. You'll be better at this if you've played some pool. But you might imagine a path like this. A good pool player would know that the ball is going to end up near the fourth position here after banking off the three sides. Now, if you moved the ball over a bit and struck it in the same direction, you'd see a shift in the path, but it's clear that it would end up roughly in the same vicinity. The difference in the initial conditions is propagated through the evolution of the system but it doesn't result in a big shift in the final conditions. Now we can think of the shift in the initial and final conditions as specifying a range, so that across this range of initial conditions, we know that the ball will end up within that range of final conditions. We could also think of the range as specifying our uncertainty about the actual position of the ball. If we knew that the ball's initial conditions were somewhere in this range, then we could predict that the final conditions would be somewhere in the final range. For a system like this, the uncertainty will grow over time, but it will grow in a linear fashion, which basically means that the range of uncertainty in the final conditions will grow slowly enough to allow for predictability. Now, let's see what happens when we change the geometry a bit. This pool table has bumps on two of the sides. If we were to send our ball toward the bump on the bottom, we know it would bounce in a specific way determined by the angle of the tangent to the curve at the point where the ball hits it. But now, even a small change in the initial conditions can result in a big change in the final path of the ball. Let's say it hits the first bump here. Where's it going to go? This looks like a plausible trajectory. The details don't really matter. That's because what we're interested in is what happens when we move our ball over and send it in the same direction. Already in your imagination, you can see that the trajectory of this ball is going to be very different from the trajectory of the first ball. This path here looks plausible and is nowhere near the first ball after just one bump. So with a system like this, the trajectory of the ball depends in a sensitive way on the initial position of the ball. Uncertainties in the initial conditions are magnified by the nonlinearities in the system so that we quickly lose our ability to predict where the ball is going to end up. We can assume that the emotions are still governed by deterministic laws, so the final state of the ball is fixed. But if there is variation in the initial conditions, or uncertainty in the initial conditions, then we lose our ability to predict the final position. This is where statistical modeling and probabilities can enter the picture. 
And this is how we can salvage the concept of a fair chance setup, even if the world is governed by deterministic laws. Now we have a story we can tell about how a coin toss, or a dice roll, or a roulette wheel spin could count as a fair chance setup, even if the outcomes are all dictated by deterministic laws. The story is that the dynamics of the coin toss, or the dice roll, or the roulette wheel spin, is such that the uncertainty we have about the initial conditions, or the natural variation in the initial conditions, is magnified by the dynamics of the toss, or the roll, or the spin, so that information about the initial conditions is diluted, and we end up with final outcome states that are distributed equally over the range of possible outcomes. This is how we can recover the standard probabilities that are associated with these kinds of setups. Now this story that I've just told is a plausible one, but it remains an empirical question whether real coin tosses and dice rolls and roulette spins actually fit this description. You actually have to study their behavior to know if this is right. Or if it's not right, why it is that they still seem to be useful approximations to a fair chance setup. Now the case I want to look at for the rest of this video is coin tossing, because it's been studied quite a bit and the results are fascinating. If you Google this topic, you'll see that much of the discussion of coin tossing centers around research by Percy Diaconis and his colleagues. You can easily find YouTube videos of Diaconis lecturing on this very topic. Now here are some interesting facts about coin tossing. If a flipped coin is caught, it has a small bias to land with the starting side facing up. So if it starts out heads up, it has a small bias to land heads up and vice versa. Where does this bias come from? It's actually a subtle effect of the physics. Coins spin end over end, but they also spin like a pizza being tossed. And if they spin, then they'll also wobble. This wobble is what physicists call precession. The effects of precession change the dynamics, and the result is a bias in favor of the starting orientation. The bias is very small, it's on the order of 1%. So if you have 100 tosses that start from heads up, the expected number of heads for a fair coin would be 50 out of 100. But for a real coin, the expected number of heads is about 51 out of 100. So it's a small bias, but it's a real bias. And interestingly, it's not very sensitive to the number of rotations or the speed of the toss. Coin flipping fact number two. Spinning coins have a large bias to land on one side or the other. Sometimes people spin a coin thinking that this is a good randomizer, but it's not. It's much less random than flipping a coin. The exact determination of the bias depends in a delicate way on the shape of the coin's edge and on the exact center of gravity. For a long time, magicians have used coins with slightly shaped edges that always come up heads. For regular coins, the bias tends to range widely from coin to coin, but the tendency is to favor tails up. Fact number three. If a coin is flipped and allowed to land on the floor, this definitely has an effect on the bias. In general, if there's bouncing involved, then the bouncing can wash out a good deal of the initial position bias. However, if the coin ends up spinning on the floor before it settles, then the spinning bias kicks in and it makes it much more predictable which way it will fall. Fact number four. The same coin flipping initial conditions generally produce the same coin flip results. In other words, coin flipping is largely governed by deterministic laws. And when you mechanically recreate the initial conditions of a coin toss with some precision, then the results are the same every time you toss the coin. Here's a picture of a device that can recreate the initial conditions of a coin toss. It's a device that Diaconis and his colleagues used in their study of bias in coin tossing. The coin is placed on the arm on the left, a specific tension is set, and the coin is released. It flies upwards in an arc, flipping over and over, and it lands on the bottom of the red cup on the right. Increasing the tension gives you a higher arc with more rotations. Diaconis and his colleagues reported that in practice, the same initial conditions gave the same result every time. So there's a sense in which coin tossing is absolutely not a random process. It's a highly deterministic process. Yet we still find it useful to use a coin toss as a randomizer. Now why do we do this? Well, the simple answer is that it's difficult for normal people in normal conditions to recreate the same tossing initial conditions in a controllable way. So the uncertainty or the range of variation in the initial conditions of our coin tosses generates uncertainty in the final result. And for a lot of practical uses, that's enough uncertainty to make a coin toss useful as a randomizer. However, there's another very interesting theoretical result that has a bearing on this question. When you model the dynamics of a coin toss, you find that as you increase the upward velocity of the coin, or the rate of angular rotation, or both, the difference in the initial conditions that determines whether the coin lands heads or tails gets smaller. What this means is that for a weak toss, there's a wider range of adjacent initial conditions that will result in a heads, and a wider range for tails. So the result 
heads or tails, is not very sensitive to the initial conditions. In this picture, the gray and white blocks represent the range of adjacent initial conditions that will result in heads or tails, respectively. So you could be a little sloppy and alter the initial conditions within a certain range and still expect the result to be heads or tails. However, when you toss the coin more vigorously, the picture looks more like this. The range of adjacent initial conditions for heads and tails has gotten smaller. In practice, this means that you need to be much more precise in your initial conditions if you want to be able to predict the outcome of the toss. Even a small change can switch it from a heads to a tails or vice versa. This means that there's a point at which, for all practical purposes, you can treat the toss as random, either because you have no idea in which block a particular toss will issue from, or because the natural variation in the initial conditions due to factors that you can't control are greater than the width of these blocks. Now I'm going to add one more coin flipping fact, which is an important one to remember. Coin flipping in the hand, where you flip and catch the coin to reveal it, is easily manipulated. With some practice, you can learn to toss a coin in the air like a pizza, so that it spins but it never flips over. So if it went up heads, it'll come down heads. Now the trick to this is to add enough wobble to the rotation so that it visually gives the illusion of flipping. This is something that almost any coin magician can do, it just takes practice. With this skill, you can win bets even if you let other people call the toss in the air. If the coin starts heads and you call heads, then I catch it in the same hand and reveal heads. If you call tails when it's in the air, I catch it, turn it over on the back of my other hand and reveal the tails. Okay, let me try to sum up the takeaway points of this video. This discussion is still under the broader topic of the gambler's fallacy, but as it should be clear by now, what I'm trying to do is use some of the issues raised by the gambler's fallacy as an entryway into a deeper set of questions about how to think about probability and randomness more generally. This discussion of coin tossing is really meant to focus our thinking on what terms like fairness, bias, independence, and randomness actually mean, and how we can use them to think about cases in the real world. The second issue I wanted to talk about is how these concepts would apply in a world that might be governed by deterministic laws. Now, this is a bothersome question for many people, who think that randomness can only make sense if events in the world are indeterministic at some level, or who are at least confused about what it would mean to say that the probability of a coin landing heads is 50% if the result is fixed by the initial conditions. So I hope the discussion has helped to see how concepts of probability and randomness might still have meaning in a deterministic world. I think the coin tossing example is informative because on the one hand, it's one of the icons of randomness and uncertainty, yet it can be analyzed as a dynamical system governed by deterministic laws. And when you do that, the result helps to explain how and why coin tosses can be good models of a fair chance setup. Now before we end, I want to emphasize that nothing that we've said here implies that the world really is deterministic. I haven't talked about quantum uncertainty or other ways that determinism may be qualified. But the fact is that when we're talking about the world of medium-sized objects like coin tosses and dice rolls, we use classical physics to model those processes. And classical physics works by modeling systems using mathematically deterministic equations. So what we're talking about here is how probability concepts can be used and interpreted within this framework. The question of whether, all things considered, we should view the world evolving in a deterministic or indeterministic fashion is a separate question that we're not addressing here.